Jackson. Join. Good morning, this is Haylan. Hey, Haylan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi everyone. Hello. All know what it's all about. <coughs> the only game in town. <laughs> they call it non-duality. Advaita in Hinduism. Non-duality means one without a second, not two. And they translate Advaita as Satchitananda, Nama Rupa. Sat is existence. Shit is consciousness, and Andrew is loving to be, or bliss of being. Nama Rupa, name and form. Name and form is Maya, illusion. That's body mind. That's what we point to, the one without a second, not two. And uh, anybody who is not existing right now? No, you all know you're existing. Anyone who is not conscious? Everyone who knows they are conscious, and anyone not happy to be? Well, nobody wants to be dead right now. And as I say, name and name and form, the body mind, the concepts we've got about ourselves, is Maya. So you already are that. And the search itself becomes the problem. Because what we how can you seek something that you already are? <coughs> and it's the belief of this separate entity, this person, that's got us into all this problem. For it's only me to be unhappy. Only me can be fearful, jealous, envious, depressed. Me is the cause of all the psychological suffering. And they are the effects of the cause. Cause and effect. That's what they call so-called karma, cause and effect. Well, what happens if you look into it and see the cause? Me is a fiction. And ask yourself the simple question. Can there be an effect without a cause? Well, can there? If you're not relating to a cause, there can't be an effect. Again, pointing out that that is all there is. And that's the great mantra, I am that. And we all know that, though we don't take any notice of it, because that's the chair you're sitting on. That's the carpet on the floor. That's the space in the room. That's the, the room. That's the space. Everything is that. What have we done? We put up names and labels and label it with the name and separate it with the, with the word. And the word is not the thing. They tell you that in the Bible. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That's all that God is, is a word. All things were made by him, by the word. And isn't that right? All these things around you, we've got words for everything. And there was nothing that was made that was made without the word. So we've taken a belief in this word and believed in it, and so it's the cause of all our problems. And that's what another thing they say, that the false cannot stand up to investigation. So this needs to be recognised and believed in. We believe we are this body-mind. But is that a fact? So you, show, you say, my body. Don't you say my house, my car, my coat? Are you the house? You're not. Are you the car? You're not. Are you the coat? You're not. Maybe you're not the body either when you come to look into it. When you do look into it, what's the body made up of? You'll see it's made up of elements. Air, earth, fire, water, space. Just like the elements around you. Well, separate yourself from those elements if you can. Stop breathing. See how long you last. Stop drinking water. Stop trying to warm yourself with the word fire or cook with it. And what's this word I or me when you come in with it? You realise there's a conceptual image of vitamins of self equipment with that words. And you realise you're not the word. 
The word water is not the word. You can't drink it. The word fire is not the fire. So we've got this word, we've taken on the belief. And what is it? It's the sense of presence. That we've got the sense of presence of beingness and we've learnt words from our parents. How many words were you born with? You weren't born with any words at all and you didn't pick up any words till you were about two, two and a half. Might have been a bit earlier or might have been a bit later, but we've learnt every word you've ever spoken has been learnt. And the word is not the real. So even today, if somebody asks you who you are, you'll say, oh, I am Bill or I am Jane or, or Jack, whatever your name might be. Instead of realising, going into it and seeing what you truly are, that you are the reality. If it's one without a second, it means it's absolute or the great perfection. And if you are the absolute and know that, who can ever be superior to you? Can't be, because all that's that. Who can be inferior to you? Nothing. Nothing superior, no inferior. And what would you want from anybody else? Nothing. It all takes place in that absolute functioning just as it is. This idea of being a person, but you didn't learn the word person till you were about two and you learnt your name. And the person comes from an ancient Latin, I think it was, the persona, the mask. We're really pointing out that what it really is is a conceptual image we have about ourselves. Instead of seeing there's one reality that pattern shapes and forms and experiences as everything, and the pattern shapes and forms, uh, that's all they are, is a vibrating pattern of energy. This body, mind you believe yourself to be, is nothing but a vibrating pattern of energy we take to be the real. Have a look at this thing called mind. If you believe you are the mind, show me your mind. And you look at it, there's no such thing as mind unless you think about it, because mind's just a word, a concept. Shakespeare told us that a couple of thousand years ago and he says there's nothing either good or bad but thinking makes it so. Without a concept, what's wrong with right now if you don't think about it? Can you say it's good, bad, pleasant, painful or anything all it's all about without a thought? But without the thought, have you disappeared? You haven't, you're still there. Breathing, heart beating, hair and fingernails growing, food being digested. The life is still there. But not, no concept to there's no, without the concept there's no person we call ourselves human beings if you believe in God you'll call God the supreme being what if you take that word supreme off and take the word human off and try and tell me you're not being you realise you cannot negate your beingness and beingness is not becoming so that's what the idea of time is against the concept also is there a past if you don't think about it? And if you have a look at that, you'll see the car. there's no past and when you, th when you think about it, the past is gone. Is there a future? You realize there's no future. Future is the anticipation and imagination. You can't tell me what you're going to do in the next five minutes. You can anticipate and imagine. Brilliant. And you can't go back and live yesterday, but you can recall it. So it's all concepts, parts, body, mind, time, space. Well, where does that leave you? It leaves you as this presence awareness. There's nobody who is not present right now and there's nobody who is unaware right now. That presence awareness or pure being. And as I say, being is not becoming. And uh, as I say, you couldn't say who or what you were when you were born. Not for the first couple of years of your life. How did you begin? Well, go back as far as you your mother. That animating life essence, that pattern you call your father. In that pattern it enabled through the food he's eaten and the, and the reading of the things that are happening. He learnt words, picked up words. And uh, that intelligence energy, the capacity of reasoning and developing in him, put labels on these words when he's hearing them, like I or me and all this other thing. 
and uh, form a little sperm formed in that pattern. That <coughs> and uh, which came from your father. For the food he's eaten, the same thing in your mother. That anionic life has in your mother enabled in that pattern. Another microscopic part of called an egg or an ovum to form. That ovum attached itself to the wall of the uterus. And the sperm swam to the ovum, implying it's not just a blob of goo, it knew what to do. It swam to the ovum and penetrated the ovum. When those two came together, what happened? That cell doubled and redoubled the intelligence that's expressing through it all, and they wanted the pattern in this shape and form of so called human being, a human form. And, we've t and so when your parents told you when you were about two, two and a half, you're little Johnny, I am little Johnny. And if somebody tells you what you ask you who you are today, you know, you'll say I am little Johnny or whatever you believe your name is. Instead of saying I am the great perfection, I am the reality, I am the one without a second, the absolute, we've taken away also this separate entity. And as I said before, it's only me can be fearful or anxious or depressed. So we go through life living as this conceptual image. But not all of us are happy with that. We've got these religions that tell you this, that or the other. And you need to become this or pray to this and worship this and do something else. Instead of really investigate and see for yourself. The false cannot stand up to investigation. And when you investigate it, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's scriptural sayings, know the truth, the truth will set you free. And the false cannot stand up to investigation. And belief is another one. We believe we are these persons, these human beings. Look up your dictionary definition of belief. It's an unquestioned acceptance of something in the absence of reason. Acceptance of an alleged fact without positive knowledge or proof. To put your belief to that test, you'll find you're not what you believe yourself to be as this person. But what are you? You can't negate your beingness, which we call life is another word. And Christ told you that when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. People thought he was talking about himself. He wasn't talking about himself. He's talking about that sense of presence that expresses through the mind as the thought I am, that same expression that's expressing through your, uh, my so-called mind as the thought I am. We all know I am. That's the great mantra. And now I am, we, everybody knows that because that, that's the chair you're sitting in. I am that. That's the chair you're sitting in. That's the carpet on the floor. That's the space outside. That's the tree. That's the flower. That's the planet, stars. Everything is already that which we put labels on it and discriminate it with the word. And the word is not the real. So we've got this discriminating belief that we are this separate entity. And it's only me that can be unhappy. Me is the cause of it. How does that work? Well, something comes up and you like it. This is good. And we don't want the things we like to go. We want to be liked all the time. We want to be happy all the time. But it's constantly vibrating. It's constantly transient. It's constantly changing. That body's changing right now. You mightn't believe it, but there are thousands of cells dying at it right at this moment and being replaced. What are you doing about that if you think you're running the show? So if something comes up and we don't we don't we want that we want it to keep it there because we like it, not realizing that everything is transient. It's all going to change. You haven't got the same body you walked into this room with 20 minutes ago or half an hour ago. It's changing right now. There are thousands of cells dying in it and being replaced. We don't want it to go, not realising that it's going to change anyway. So what do we do? We resist it. And don't you realise that resistance is conflict? If you're resisting anything, you're in conflict with it. And conflict makes you unhappy, uneasy, and depressed or guilty. Well, that's uneasiness, there's another word for that, is disease. So there's resistance, conflict, and disease going on. The other way around, something comes up that I don't like. Oh, I shouldn't be thinking this way, I'm a bad person, I'm doing this, I've got to get rid of this one. What do we do? We try to force it out, so we resist it. 
whichever way it goes, we're resisting on both sides. So no wonder we're in this constant unhappiness and misery. Why are you unhappy? As Wei Weiwei says, because everything you say, everything you do, and everything you think is for yourself. And he says there isn't one. And that's a fact when you look at it. There's no personal self. There is just this life. And you are that life. And that's what needs to be recognised and seen. And nobody's going to do it for you. Because if it's absolute, if it's a one essence, there is no one apart from, separate from you. It's a wall appearance. They call it a phenomenal manifestation. Definition made of phenomena. And the definition of phenomena is that which appears to be. So you and I and everything else in this manifestation is appearance. And not at all appearing. Well, they call it the basic space of phenomena. The base of everything is space. Now, see if you can find a beginning to space. You realise there's no beginning to space whatsoever. They can say it's a billion light years away or something like that. But what would that be in? That would have to be in something. It would have to be in space. So space is the absolute, it's the reality. And everything is a vibrating pattern or the content of space. And space is no thing. It hasn't got any shape, any form, any beginning, any end, any circumference, any centre. It is no thing. Can something come from no thing? Not nothing. When they say nothing, I am nothing, well, they stuffed it up already because nothing means vacuum, void, zero. But no thing is different. No thing means it's got no pattern, no shape, no form. It, it seemingly is. You can't say it is not, but you can't say what it is either. And uh, the Sagarada tells you nothing can trouble you except in your own imagination. We'll break that word imagination down to image in, imagine. And realise we're creating mental images and conceptual images all the time. You look in a mirror, what do you see? You'll see in a reflection or an image. Now you can't say it's not there. You often try to the mirror and try and grab the image out of the mirror. You can't say it is there. So, it, like everything else in this manifestation, it's seemingly appearing, but it's not there as reality. A pattern, shape and form, as we said earlier in the piece, is illusion, it's Maya. But the basic space of phenomena, there's nothing you can postulate or think of that can be outside of space. What it is, what, it, what, what space, body, mind and all these things that are patterning, shape and forms are that space-like intelligence energy. I call it intelligence energy. Intelligence is knowing. Is there anybody who is not knowing right now? No, you'll say, of course I'm knowing. And the knowing, the ING, is something that's in an activity or a movement. Any activity is a movement of energy. So that's where the term intelligence, energy comes from. The activity of knowing. Being, knowing, seeing, hearing, thinking, it's all an activity. Thinking. Tasting, touching, smelling. So see how the function is going. What's your next thought going to be? There's nobody can tell me what your next thought's going to be. But the thought will come up. And what do we do? We claim it as oh, I think this thought. As soon as you say oh, I think, what have you done? You've formed a subject, a thinker. And oh, I've become the thinker. And the thought has become the object. What have we done? We've divided the spontaneous functioning into subject object, dualistic thinking. And that's gone on from there because we've never questioned it, never realised it. We've never looked at it any further when you were told you're little Johnny. From that. But down through the ages there have been a few that have looked through it, looked into it, and seen through it, and pointed to the reality. And that's what the great traditions form around. But they've been co corrupted and contaminated along the way. And we get lost in them. Bring them down to their bare reality, and you'll see that that is true. Everything is already that. Intelligence, energy. 
thought comes up and I like it. Not realising it's transient. We want to keep it there. But being transient is going to change. And when it changes, this believed in I takes delivery of it and becomes fearful, anxious about it or unhappy. And so all this conflict goes on because we think there's something other than us. And while there's more than one, while there is any dualism, there'll always be conflict. It's only when it's recognised for what it is. The one reality is it's patterning, shaping, forming and appearing and expressing as everything. <coughs> That's when the joyousness is there, the sense of well-being. Thoughts are not getting locked into the conflict of good and bad, pleasant, painful, and they're two ends of the one stick. They're not divided at all. The trouble is we divide them. But have a look at this manifestation. Could there be good without bad? Could there be bad without good? Could there be day without night? Or silence without sound? Movement without stillness? You without me? Without this dualistic patterning, shape and forming, there couldn't be any of those things. So it's all a conceptual imaging which are dividing the indivisible. And that division is dualism. And that's where the problem lies. It's only me being unhappy or fearful or anxious. I've said all this before, I think. So uh, going over it again. <clears throat> so me is the cause of all my problems. When I recognise that this me is a fiction, what must be there? Well, there can only be a sense of well-being. Being well. Nothing wrong anymore. And that's what they call it, the bliss or the love of being. That everybody loves to be. But that dualistic patterning doesn't happen, as I say. Could there be day without night? Well, to look outside now, the, from this point of view, the Earth's rolling around the sun. This side, the Earth's facing the sun at the moment, and it's light. When it rolls around a bit further, the side will be dark. And the other side will be light. Now, does the, day, does the day know anything about darkness? It doesn't. And does no light know anything about darkness? Does the sun know anything about darkness? It doesn't. And does the darkness know anything about the sun? It doesn't. And so they say all this manifestation is a conceptual manifestation, conceptual imaging. And that's true. Taking the sun again in the light. <coughs> you go out in the society day, you see things are not always as they appear to be. You go down to the ocean, if I said to you, get me a bucket of blue water out of the sea, what would you say? You say, don't be an idiot, because you know the water's not blue. And it's never blue, never was blue, and never will be blue, but we believe it to be blue. The same with a clear sky. No clouds in the sky, it's blue. The sky is space. This is space. Where's the blueness? Many metaphors they use to point out the conceptual images we take to be real and not real at all and miss out on the reality of seeing the conceptual. And from that, where the me causes all our problems. When it's two ends of the one stick, good and bad are not separate. Pleasant, painful, happy, sad, loving, hating. They're not separate at all. And when the th thing comes up again, you say, I think. Now investigate that. Can the thought, I think, actually think? And you investigate, you see, the thought can't think. Can the thought, I see, see? The thought, I see, can't see. The thought, I hear, hear. It can't hear. The thought, I'm aware. Is that your awareness? Mm. It's none of these things. It's just description or words or labels we put on these things to take their reality. But there is seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, feeling, thinking. All those things are spontaneously vibrating and happening. And the words we put on the discriminator have been picked up too and they're happening with that. But it's all a spontaneous, natural, effortlessly functioning. And it's all, as they tell you in Buddhism, it's the great perfection. 
And they give it in one sentence there. The great perfection is non-conceptual awareness. There's nobody who is unaware right now. And they call it space-like awareness. They all point to it. It's all there, quite open and accurate, but it's unnoticed or ignored. That's why they call it ignorance in the scriptures. Not that we're dull or stupid and we don't know. It means we just it's there in front of our very eyes, but we're missing out on it. What's the very first thing you see? And you open your eyes and say, I see you. Well, I see my glasses. You don't. You're seeing the space that's just behind your ears. The first thing you see is space. And there's nothing that you can see that's outside of space. So we're seeing the actual base of it and not recognising it. And locked into the conceptual, taking the conceptual to believe. And it's only me that can be anxious, fearful, depressed, guilty. Me is the cause of all the psychological suffering. And they are the effects. So-called karma, me, cause and effect. Take away the cause and effect, what are you left with? Just what is. And what is is not what was. It's not what will be. It is this actuality, because time, again, as I said before, is a mental concept. That's what we point to, the absolute, that everything is that. And quite a few of in here already know that, have looked into it and investigated and been unhappy the way things were and looked deeper and seen it for themselves. Now that's what we ask you to share. Let's know if you've got anything to say. Don't hesitate because it might be said in a way someone else who doesn't recognise it fully might hear it and resonate with them and help them to understand it. <coughs> and uh, others that just knew might, you know, need to recognise it and those if you've got any doubts or have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them. But keep it going, keep it active, keep it alive, because that's the only way it's been passed down through the ages. And when, 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 years and years ago, there were only a few that could un, had understood it and could pass it on, and so there was very few that really knew it. That's why there's a big spiritual religions and that formed around them. They set up those that understood it and grasped it as saints, sages, saviors and seers and worshipped the messenger and missed out on the message. The messenger is not worth a pinch of shit. It's the message itself that is the reality. And you are already that because that is all there is. So, Captain, where are you? You can host it now and call on you to do it now. The cat's not going to help you. <laughs> she's a brave girl. She's not. She's not that way. <laughs> okay, so uh, now we are inviting everyone to, to share. Come stay there. Stay there. And we have a couple of comments from online community. We have good morning messages and we have a message from uh, Catherine and James who says, so grateful to Bob for the community pointing out that we are love to you all, Satchitananda. So, uh, <coughs> anyone would like to start and maybe yeah. highlight something you would like to start? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I just, um, what's been coming up is, um, you know, how, how it was before I met Bob and um, how it was was, uh, <laughs> I spent my entire life uh, being being believing I was separate, as Bob has pointed out, and uh, and was often in conflict not only with myself but with others. Uh, I had been searching um, since I uh, took a recovery from a twelve step program for a, a concept of God that worked for me, uh, and so I I was doing meditation. Uh, I'd been sort of deprogrammed, if you like, by another teacher 
and his and his followers and was given four techniques of meditation and uh, I, I used to sit down I had a 12 year old and a two year old at the time I used to try and sit down two hours a day one one hour in the morning one hour at night and uh, around this time I lost my uh, father my sister and my mother uh, all within two years it was quite hard uh, and I was trying to raise two kids and I was doing this meditation and trying to work and study and God knows what. And uh, around that time I met Bob. Uh, I'd met him actually before that, speaking at meetings. And, um, and I wanted what he had. There was something in him that I wanted, you know. And uh, around that time other people started talking to him and um, I started going to these these talks he was doing, very small little talks above the health food shop. And um, he gave me a copy of I Am That, which I, I read. He said, read it and then just read it again. And uh, I knew that I had gone beyond the need for further help. Uh, I knew that what he was transmitting to me was the truth. And, uh, but that didn't mean that for a long time uh, the mind or the memory came in to take ownership of things and there was still lots of conflict in my life and, um, you know, I, I had a hard road um, but I knew deep down that this was it and um, I... Um, stopped sitting down. I, I used to hear my kids screaming up and down the hallway, you know, play fighting. And and uh, I just had this profound realisation that I just am and that, you know, I'm the action figure and action needs to be taken in the moment spontaneously without any story. So I just got up and told my kids off and I, I never really sat down for a formal meditation ever since. And... Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean to say there aren't times when I sit quietly and uh, just enjoy uh, that beingness. But I do that when I'm running around as well. So I, this is what came up for me today, um, that there is no me. There never has been a me. I'm very grateful to Bob for pointing that out. Would you like to say something? I'm not sure about Okay, we have, yes? Yeah, there is a couple of comments here on the screen. And uh, Julia says, I don't know how you are feeling today, Bob, but you sound amazing. Mm. And yes, that was pretty mm. beautiful delivery. She also comments on the cat paralysis. And Mukti says, absolutely, sounding vibrant and strong. Yes, there are better days and there are worse days. <coughs> and today it was uh, beautiful. So if anyone would like to highlight whatever you heard, from Bob speaking, maybe a sentence stood out or maybe a description of a particular metaphor or maybe there is anything at all that kind of mm, uh, rang true in your heart that is worthy of highlighting because as Bob said before, sometimes hearing it from someone else who just <coughs> realizes it might be more of the wavelength of the group than someone with 48 years of clarity. <laughs> so if there is anything that anyone would like to highlight or clarify or, or, or bring forth, particularly from the spear, we don't necessarily focus on what other people say or other books say. It's just, uh, it's just really about this moment, what actually stands out and resonates now. Lucky. Yeah, okay. Um, I think today in the, the spiel, Bob, when you were talking about kind of no past, no future, that is something that's been really, I guess, useful recently because, you know, in daily life, I'm always planning, you know, you need to plan things and mm. make plans and whatever, but when it comes to the you know, this endeavor, that process is almost the exact opposite of what needs to happen. And I think I find myself sometimes like, oh, you know, the last two weeks I wasn't 
wasn't a present enough or things like that. <laughs> and like, I need a plan to be more present. And, and it's funny because that is practicing the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And all there is, is right now seeing that, you know, that's, that's just a thought about the past. That's just a thought about the future. And the only thing you ever have to do is right now, like the practice is right this moment. And it's actually such a relief every time I come back and see that truth, because there's this inevitable tension when you start building up a plan to achieve some imaginary mm. state. And it's like, oh no, now I have to make sure I achieve that plan. And this tension is the opposite. And when you see the moment as it is, that's the only practice there ever is. Mm. And that's any thought about the future is just resolved instantly because you know the, the most important thing is just seeing in this moment and past and future disappear. And yeah, that's just, it's so simple that it's uh, <laughs> forgotten often. Um, but then <laughs> that's just a thought. So yeah, that was, that was what I was coming up today. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, that's Very beautiful. Lucky. That's beautiful. And that's, that, that's really the, the, the essence. You see how we set ourselves for, for failure by planning mm. for future achievement and missing out on this moment right now. You call it practice of recognizing now. And I know it's a common sort of a theme. Bob calls it recognition. Because you can't practice the now, but if the now kind of makes itself clear, ah, that's the that's the recognition, spontaneous yeah. recognition. It's just seeing or mm -hmm. being and seeing the attempt to create a practice is yeah. it, <laughs> just like every time. Yeah. That's what the Buddha calls cognizing emptiness. We think we cognize emptiness, but it's not. It's the emptiness that's doing the cognizing. He made the statement that then that emptiness is form, and the form can be nothing other than the emptiness. The point is, all empty forms appearing as real. Isn't it? Mm. Thanks. And also, when you again look from the perspective of life, life doesn't mind. You know, the life, the space like awareness, the whole field of consciousness, it doesn't mind whether you are alert, fascist, counting every second, whether you were right here or not. From the life's perspective, time of inattention is equally precious. That's the experiencing and expression. Even if the whole life, right from the age of two to yesterday, there was inattention, life doesn't mind. Or there is no such thing, really. It's just attention being scattered or attention moving wherever it is, uh, wherever it needs to be. It's just the thought arises and judges it and says, no. I shouldn't have watched Netflix or I shouldn't have done this. I should have done something else. But that's impossible. Mm. S life is unfolding as it does. It's impossible to, it's only an imagination that can tell you that you could have or should have or would have do something different. Mm. Mm. And just realizing that again, like, ah, oh, this moment is lucid. And the next hour may not be, I don't, who cares? Life doesn't. Mm. Mm. It's just acknowledging those moments when the realization is present and just giving them a big, warm smile. Mm. And the rest are fine. It's like, the, it's like the wildlife, you know, they need to chase or be chased or do all the other things. And then when there is nothing else to do, they bask in the sun. Mm. <laughs> Anyone? That's, that's such a beautiful highlight because I have years and years of seeking behind. Like nine years ago, I was on that path of seeking where I would self-sabotage by beating myself up every day that I'm not doing enough, that I'm not trying enough, I'm not trying hard enough, I'm not present enough, I'm not meditating enough. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve the freedom or enlightenment because I'm bad. I'm not giving my best. This is the most important thing in my life and I'm still not doing the best. <coughs> See how solid and reinforced the sense of I is in such narrative? 
my goodness, the eye is so solid. I mean, of course it isn't, there is no such thing. But the sense of feeling of eye, eye that doesn't do enough, eye that doesn't put all heart into a practice, that is such a solid eye. It isn't, but it feels like this. And the suffering is so immense. That suffering coming from self-inflicted pain, that I'm not enough, I'm not doing enough, I'm, I'm worthless, I don't deserve it, I'll never get it. Well, that's true, the I will never get it because I isn't real, it can't get it. And it's nothing to get either, it's just this moment now as it unfolds. The I has the story, the I is a story. And that story is part of a story that there is someone who can achieve something. There isn't really anything, there's nothing going on. And it's never enough of highlighting it. Just seeing how that narrative is betraying this moment, this aliveness, this radiant moment of being present. And going, exchanging it for the story of past or future, a story of me. And just realizing that, it can either cause extreme suffering if the I is still involved, or it can just be a cosmic joke, it can make you laugh. Yeah, whoops, oh, it did it again. And it's funny because there's no one doing it. It's just a mechanical habit pattern. So everyone has that sort of a habit pattern. It's, there's no guilt, there's no shame, there's no one who is doing anything wrong at all. It's just the narrative is as mechanical as digestion. So why take it personally? Uh, can you pass the mic? Yeah, just, just, just adding to that, um, uh, that that truth about there is there is no person. Um, it just reminds me. I was sitting with a friend um, some time ago in the botanical gardens, a very beautiful, peaceful um, uh, setting, and um, and my friend is um, uh, yeah, he's very interested in this path as well, but has trouble um, um, not thinking and being burdened by thinking and so on and and she kind of said uh, well look even when I see a leaf over there I start worrying about well what are leaves about how do they relate to everything and then you know, the whole <laughs> thought process you know starts again mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, I, and I kind of just said well yeah but th there's nobody actually worrying mm -hmm. it's just worry yeah. taking place uh, as, a, as a happening as an unfolding of there's, there's nobody actually worrying it's just worry happening sort of thing and um and i think that um you know that's, that's such that's a kind it. of relief and and yeah, yeah okay and it, but you, you do tend to keep forgetting that because um yeah. language operates on subject object yeah. like it's just a subject object um system yeah. Right, and and so even when you're thinking, we we tend to think in language, mm -hmm. so it's it's very um, it's very it's very uh, it, it gets in there again, you know, very subtly, and <laughs> yeah, so yeah. But that's that's beautifully put. Absolutely, there's just a worrying happening. I love when Bob brings up the whole non-duality collapsing the language into the ing, into the process ing. You know, seeing is happening. And the language, the dualistic the, the translator, the machine translating singularity into duality straight away says, no, seeing's not going on. It's the I and the scene, the two things. But if not for the seeing, those two, the subject object, wouldn't have ever, couldn't have existed. And same with the worrying is happening. And then there is an I and there is an object of worry. <laughs> and and the, the T you can f you can feel the difference so distinctly <laughs> when you, when you come to, you know come to the awareness again, you yes. can feel the difference so so distinctly, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. and and it's beautiful how you actually pointed it out to her, because then you can translate it to anything that doesn't inherently contain the I, like digesting is happening. Yes. But you don't say, I digest the breakfast. No, it's digesting happening. Or yeah. the circulation of the blood is happening. Mm -hmm. But there is that, that language doesn't actually give credit to anyone that circulates the blood. Mm -hmm. And the same happens with the narrative. The same ink translates to every activity. And then 
the I is completely redundant and life just goes on. Forgetting is happening or, you know, like ruminating is happening or planning is happening. It's just a part of a <coughs> happening. See if we have any online comments. Let's see. Nope. Yes. Uh, Catherine says, thank you so much, Jane. Beautiful, heartfelt sharing. And Primali says, wow, Kat. And John David says, while most practices uh, revolve around the mind to see that we are not the body wipes out the mind BC all thoughts are connected to the body this has been coming up more often in my experience lately yeah you can you can notice that how the thoughts are usually related to the whole body mind system personalizing things and Julia says uh, while there appears to be a preference for the expression intelligence energy, that expression is synonymous with the expression truth, God, and or I am, prior to the words I am. I am that I am. There is only that I am. I used to pray to God while not recognizing that what apparently happened was imagination, thought, talking to thoughts. The way I see it now is if I ever feel separate or I'm wanting to connect with the actual God or any other idea, the way is simply to relax, rest, and know the truth that I am rather than believe it. Belief requires a thought. Truth is beyond thoughts. That's beautiful. Thank you, Julia. And Catherine says, James says, the seeds of ultimate truth are being <coughs> planted all the time by Bob and Kat. Stay with them and they will definitely sprout. Let them unfold. That's beautiful too. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's why I always invite to look for what resonates because if there is something that doesn't, along the way it may. It is, it is funny how the non-duality is really a description. It's like when, when Bob is giving a spiel, moment to moment he is describing his direct experience and whatever is the consequence and w showing it in many, many different ways. Sometimes some things may not resonate or may feel heady, but the level of relaxation as it deepens, as it sinks in, you kind of realize, aha, this is what he meant. Initially, it kind of doesn't sit well. But if you actually really bring up and highlight and stay with what does ring the bell, all the rest will ultimately just make itself clear. Anything anyone would like to highlight or ask or dispute? <laughs> Everything can be disputed and that's fun too. Mm -hmm. It is fun not to get attached to any ideas. Thank you for the pointers and insights brought forth in words, Bob. Um, the most powerful pointer for me is what's wrong with right now if you don't think about it. I've used that a few times, or it's just it's just popped in when there might be a thought spiral since seven weeks ago when I was here. Um, the one thing that I felt like from the spiel that was up for dispute in the head was um, you know you leave concepts out with your shoes but there was the messenger isn't worth a pinch of shit and you know we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you <laughs> and there's a lot of people delivering messages that I would look at them and be like oh they've got some They've got some habits and some things. Do I want to follow their message? Um, and, you know, there's these things. People might have realised these pointers, integrating them into their lives, 
but they still carry forth patterns and habits and things like that. But that's the point where a messenger might have dealt with a lot of these habits and patterns and they're worth listening to and worth more than a piece of shit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. That's beautiful. The idea of Christianity was to pretend that you are Jesus, pretend that you are saint. That's not what he meant. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, yes, Nisargadatta was smoking cigarettes. I wonder how many people took up smoking because he did. That's, that's, that's not what he was pointing at. Yeah. And that's why I love mm. when, although he is the most pri precious thing in the whole dream <laughs> for me. Know. Yeah, he, he is the ultimate, ultimate manifestation of life for me. He's just a, uh, yeah. A speechless, but you're right. It's just a mouth mouthpiece. It's the message that counts. I was doing a lot of smoking and drinking, but recognizing them as habits and patterns, they just dropped away. Um, not to say that I won't have the occasional social, but that's just—it's not a habit or a pattern anymore. So it's good. Mm. And some of them won't. You know, some habit patterns don't drop away. And that's perfect too. I mean, you wouldn't want the <coughs> habit of, let's say, showering to drop away, <laughs> or, mm. or you know, it's just, it's it's just life, and life doesn't mind whether you smoke or not. The mm. dream character, yes, it may actually have some good involvement in staying healthy and happy and fit, but that's within the context of the dream. Mm. And Bob has that sort of a, a trait in the makeup of the dream character to actually just look after the body, just look after it. But if someone doesn't, like Nisargadatta didn't, it's not, there is no superiority or inferiority because again, from life's perspective, life has it all. Every single junkie and every single millionaire and every single beggar is an expression of life. And every flower and fish and bird is an expression of life. Mm. And neither is better or superior but for those that haven't quite got the pointers yet, if there's a message being delivered, the messenger seems to, you know, if someone is taking care of their body, there's going to be a lot more per people that will be attracted to and listen to that person. The message can spread further from... I see there'd be more attraction to somebody that was delivering a message that was taking care of the body than wasn't because there's not too many questions arise and thoughts arise for the people listening that has this person got the message or are they just delivering it <coughs> and I guess that's where it doesn't matter if you're just listening to it yeah but yeah no it doesn't matter see if you again look at life there is more attraction to an athlete a football player or an actor who is pretending to be other people than to guru who is healthy or unhealthy. Mm. The way the life is expressing and finding that attraction, the way the attention moves, <coughs> is unrelated. Because again, life, from the life's perspective, it realizes it all. Attraction to an actor or musician, an attraction to a spiritual teaching, an attraction to uh, self-improvement. And it, yeah, it, it, it all works <coughs> itself out. Mm. And again, neither one is better than the other. Attraction to particular diet or particular way of spending time. Yeah. And f for you, it may be, you know, the resonation may be kind of stronger and it may be just a, the same sort of as a closer wavelength to someone who lived by example. Mm. But believe me, I know people who actually are more attracted to charismatic hypocrites then <laughs> to someone who is genuine but is not self-marketing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And, oh yeah, that's it. Give it a go, Dean. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, well, there's nothing really to... I, I, I can't say anything. Um, mm. 
because because like um, <clears throat> what, what what's what could what could you say like um um no, I just might just leave it because I've got a sore throat. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's what you can so say. <laughs> <laughs> Only a sore throat. <laughs> <laughs> um, what resonated with me today is like the um, instantaneous what's happening. Mm. Like that you're just seeing, hearing. Yeah. And that you don't claim the thought. Like... Mm. This is my fault. <laughs> um, when Bob was talking about it, um, yeah, it's like, yeah, we think we're in control of everything, and it gets us in a lot of trouble. Mm. And we also think that we're all these people, like that we can do all these things on this earth, <laughs> and really, yeah, if there was no people. I don't know. I think insects and stuff are just as just the same, really. Mm. Like animals and but we think we're bigger and better sometimes. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love when you say, you know, the idea of talking and now there is a bob talking. The idea of just fear of hearing. And now the mind comes and says, oh, this is Bob, oh, this is Jane, oh, this is that, oh, this is that. But without those labels, or even inclusive of those labels, it's just the whole field of hearing. Yeah. Some things are audible, some things are only narrated, yep. but it is just one hearing, one field. Yeah. And just noticing the mind activity, it's what an incredible, what an incredible tool. Yeah. So you don't hate it, you don't want to silence it, you don't want to touch it. You just hold space for it and let it do whatever it does, even if it habitually tells you that you're not good enough. You just, what an incredible idea. How could you not be good enough? I mean, stupid. Hello, yeah, how <laughs> stupid is that? Yeah. You are that source, life essence, vibrating into infinite amount of shapes and patterns and forms. And even that one pattern called Brendan, is still the same absolute. It mm. couldn't be anything but perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it couldn't. It's, it's not separated. Yeah, it's laughable sometimes. It is, yeah. Yeah, we think we're... Yeah. And how, how lovely to laugh at the idea yeah. of, of the narrative which used to hurt. Yeah. What a freedom. And not needing to change it or, you know, like you have different... And they absolutely wonderful and helpful. The the ideas uh, they also an expression of that life essence of different therapies or hypnotherapy mm. or CBT or <coughs> trauma related therapy, which is kind of attempting at rewrite the narrative. Mm. How beautiful! But then you step back and you also see there is a freedom from any sort of narrative without a need to even touch it. Yeah. Again, not to undermine all those fantastic tools, which are also an expression of life, absolutely yeah. beautiful and perfect as everything in life. <coughs> Sometimes they're worse. needed to slow down some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah and, and other tools like music or, yeah. or running, yeah. <laughs> jogging, whatever yeah. works. Yeah, and then seeing that life unfolding in all those ways and just being that relaxed space mm. for life always every moment because it's, it's nothing else you ever are yeah even if you imagine to be something limited within that space yep. that imagination that image is also contained in that field of knowing yeah mm. okay no way out gilbert says uh, attraction is duality. There is no duality in non-duality. One without a, without a second <coughs> is totally free of attraction. 
And being free of attraction, it can totally watch how the attention is moving from the chocolate ice cream to the peppermint mm -hmm. ice cream <laughs> and how the attention can switch the attraction. But yes, as he says, it, the field is um, absolutely free. It's free from attachment to any of those movements. Kat um, <coughs> mentioned the phrase that rang a bell here, uh, charismatic Hypocrites. Hypocrites. <laughs> I was watching this little bit of entertainment. Uh, it's called the AFL Grand Final. <laughs> and uh, all of the players, when they did something which was spectacular, like take a great mark or kick a goal, they celebrated these moments with uh, spectacular fashion. And um, it's an example, most of the time, of this charismatic uh, uh, expression, um, char charismatic hypocrites, if you like. And there was one thing that, that happened, one instant that happened that I've never seen before. And it was such a lovely expression. This... Um, uh, player he usually celebrates a goal and he kicks a lot of goals usually celebrates a goal with a <coughs> impersonation of someone on, on a uh, Harley Davidson motorcycle revving the motorcycle this time uh, the television camera had a medium distance shot and it showed thousands of people behind the goals and this player turned around with his back to the camera looked at the audience put his hands together in a like that and made a deep bow to the to the audience mm. I thought that was just a beautiful expression of uh, uh, gratitude to the absolute mm. it was just quite Amazing moment. It is beautiful. And on that note, we are also deeply, deeply appreciative of having you guys around to, to just, you know, stay in that warmth of that campfire investigation, looking into the essence of things. We don't really do it by ourselves. When we sit together, we usually don't discuss non duality <laughs> it's nothing to discuss and it is really it, it, it is sweet to, to just look into that source of the light so thank you oopsie <laughs> be having a, a talkative talkative day um, <laughs> but, but just on the the, the, the the grand final and sport and gestures that um, I must admit I'm less of an AFL person more of a, a Champions League person but um, soccer but uh, a lot of the a lot of the players if soccer players when they do something pretty amazing they will make a sort of gesture uh, looks like to God to me Wow. Um, because a lot of, I mean, the game's very multicultural. A lot of players come from um, um, quite traditionally religious backgrounds mm. now, and uh, and often when they when they score an amazing goal or something, they will um, they will make some sort of gesture upwards. <laughs> uh, which I mean, I know I know it can be an empty ritual, but but um, it kind of often looks genuine, in it, which is quite nice, you know, mm. uh, especially in contrast with the. Um, a lot of the egotistical uh, stuff that goes on, you know. <laughs> um, but I was just going to say, on the on the subject of sort of, um, you know, bits of language that resonate, it, it's amazing to me how, well, how you can hear the same thing over and over and, and still not get it and then finally get it. Um, but also how a, a, a tiny little um, 
a tweak of language can just do something yeah. you know and um um i think as as you were saying bob you know that it's, it's always like there are two processes going on um what one is the, the sort of netty netty sort of process where okay I, I'm, I can't be that I'm, I'm not that um but then okay so what am i hey um and the uh the intelligence energy the the presence now f for me um the phrase i am that uh, was perplexing I, I i somehow i couldn't quite uh, focus or uh, but when when I um, when I turned it into or into um, I am this this is where I'm looking what's happening here mm -hmm. and and for me I mean it's just an anecdote but it might not work for other people but um, for me that just allowed me to somehow get some kind of a um, direct glimpse of presence I think. Uh, oh gosh! Yeah, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, and you know that that um, sense that that it's something so simple, and it, it's, that's why it's overlooked. <laughs> and just that little tweak of I am this rather than I am that, just for me, mm -hmm. uh, just did something. You know, yeah. So <laughs> mention that. <laughs> if everything is that, this is that too. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's it's just a language thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And and Mahavakya, the the great mantra, uh, in direct translation, isn't "I am that," oh. but "that I am." Ah, okay. So that the only knowing that there ever is, mm. is the knowing that I am, that I am, not what I am, but that I am. I am that is actually, yeah, because that has been translated. Bob had beautifully put it down to the uh, showing that that represents everything. Mm. So he kind of got out of the conundrum of, of, of what's that? Yeah. But the truth is, the only thing that you ever know is that you are. Mm. Not this you are, but that you are. You know that you are. Everybody knows that they are. Mm. There's no one who doesn't know that they are. And that's the non-conceptual knowing. If you look at the newborn baby, you see the consciousness lit out their eyes. There is the awareness of presence, even though there is no concept that they are. There is no conceptual knowing. A conceptual knowing isn't really a knowing. <laughs> but the knowing that they are, I look at the cats, they obviously conscious, they know that they are. Although, of course, not in the same way that we translate it to the words. Like, you know, Bob sometimes says, you know, two plus two is four. You know it without conceptualization. Or the, you know, the taste of water. Once you tasted it, you know it without needing to describe it or, 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 <coughs> or have words for it. That, uh, that knowing. But that, that we are is even more prim primary. Mm. And, I, and I think for me the um, no, oh, how can I put it? Um, so y you know you can kind of um, elim eliminate process of elim elimination the netty netty mm. sort of right. So so that, then what's left and and um, the way uh, the way you mentioned Bob that you know it's it's absolute and, and perfection. The, these are these are extremely um let's say positive words or right um and so it's obviously not just an absence of everything else yes it's not something but it's 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 like wonderfulness mm -hmm. and splendor and um um you know, or it's at the top of the range in terms of what language can can say in terms of, and so I, I think that for me, um, you know, once you get a little glimpse, then the th that kind of grows and and develops, and and that's yeah, mm. that start all starts to make sense, <laughs> uh, not just sense, but yeah.
<laughs> yeah. Can you say something? No? I, I, and I want to say what Bob usually, I, I find it really incredibly beautiful when you were saying that it is not a nothing. That's precisely how, Bo how Bob describes it, because the only accurate description is to put it in negatives. If you put it in positives, then of course the mental images will straight away appear. Okay, absolute. Oh, it will be brilliant, ecstatic, blissful, pleasurable. All that stuff, it gets straight away associated. But when Bob says it is not a thing, but it's not nothing. It's not nothing. It's not, not, not a vacuum, not a void. It is no <coughs> thing. It can't be objectified as a thing. But at the same ta time, yes, it is the you know the very prolific vibrational radiance that you know that expresses the whole universe as the absolute, and yet is still not a thing, and not nothing. <laughs> and I think what happens is um, you become you become so much more attracted to to that than that the narration, you know, and that narration sort of loses its power. That's that's what happens here. And then I'll be just doing the little action figure thing around and then a, a solution will come up, not from the mind, about something I need. You know, like as I'm going about my daily thing and I and I've noticed I, I'm always saying thank you thank you you know because it's like it puts everything in my plate you know in front of me in my place and I haven't done anything you know and there's no story about it but it, it's just all these things come up and I, I just go wow thank you you know whereas there used to be this agonizing trying to figure everything out that does that doesn't happen here, um, it's just, you know, something arises and then <laughs> what I need is put in front of me. Whereas a lot of my life was, you know, up here in the head, trying to figure everything out. Well, it's very quiet there, you know, <laughs> which is good. And, uh, you know, just a lot of the things I need are put in front right there and I just am so grateful as I, and I find myself saying thank you a lot. Yeah, yeah I'm not used to this yeah. thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> feels weird. Um, used to come here many, many years ago and I, I was a very earnest uh, seeker in those days. Uh, always felt like a kid, you know, so, so, you know, <laughs> wanting to speak next. And, and today I just want to say we came here to pay homage to Bob. Um, Bob used to say to me things like, you can companion with a stone, and I used to wonder what he meant. It was like some Zen koan. And yet we were in Central Australia fairly recently and we went to a place, we went to a number of places, but we went to this one place and while we were there, it occurred to me that the, um, there were no fossils there because the rocks actually predated life, yet I really felt connected. And, and maybe to the intelligence in, in the actual rocks and stones and, and the, um, just the landscape and the, the incredible impact it had on, on us, you know. It, it was just amazing. And I thought of Bob while we were there saying to me you can companion with a stone because the whole time we, we were up there for about a week and uh, it was quite impactful in many ways but um, one of the things like I work a day job I, I work in construction it's a very testosterone sort of driven industry and highly competitive and cutthroat and, and I got back to work and people would say, you know, how, how was your holiday? I'd say it was really good. And they'd say, what was special about it? And I'd say, well, well, the whole time we were away, I was where I was, you know? And um, you can't wish for a better experience than that. 
but the the bedrock of that experience is is actually from coming here mm. years and years ago, you know. Mm. Mm. And um, like Jane, I bumped into Bob at, at a at a meeting many years ago, and he came up to me after it. And he said, "I liked what you had to say," you know. I said, "Oh, thanks," you know. And he said, "Oh, you might like to come and visit me," you know. And so I started coming to see him, and, and initially I was so sort of full of ego, I thought I was visiting this old guy who was lonely, <laughs> you know, and it took a while, it really took a while to realise he was teaching me, you know, so uh, I'm forever grateful for, yeah. for that. Yeah, me too. And I'm forever grateful you came along with. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and I don't know, same but different. Um, I was just thinking today when you were speaking, Bob, and um, just that real warmth I got from when you were speaking and on the, you know, nothing's not nothing, um, the no thingness and the, and when you, I don't know, when there's, you know, getting caught up in a whole lot of stuff um, and drama and intensity and a whole lot of life happening. You know, I was just feeling that today, like it just doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, that that, that that happens and behind that there's, there is this kind of loving to be and, mm -hmm. and love and, and warmth towards that. You know, like you were saying it too, Kat, I think, just about the, you know, not getting down, you know, going, oh, God, you know, you've done it again or <laughs> whatever. But it's, you know, it's fine. It's just mm -hmm. fine. And... um yeah, and I suppose in terms of the homage a bit today too, because it's just it's been a little while since I've been up here and seen you, Bob. And um, I suppose just that constancy over the years too about it's all, that it is all okay, and you know, and the no judgment and the um, and the smiling and nodding at it all, <laughs> it's, it's great, you know. Um, yeah, I'm just very grateful for that, Bob. Just, just want to state the obvious, but what um, when Jane was speaking about these, uh, this expression of everything being provided for you, um, I wonder what there's a little blue book behind where Bob's sitting. It's called the P the precious treasury of the basic space of phenomena, <laughs> and that's it what Jane was talking about. Mm. This illusory creation is providing everything that we need in the moment. Mm. And it's this precious treasury that Long Chempa <laughs> gave it that name, I think. Mm. Precious treasury, mm. the basic space. Thank you, Ross. Yeah, beautiful. And thank you, Jane, for the sincerity and uh, earnestness of your contribution. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll give you this one. Hello. Um, something that I always feel here um, and something that I felt a lot the last two years is that although you might not see it um, you're held and just when I come here it's just like such a a relief and there's just such a trust and a gratitude and when you were sharing Jane just like I was crying behind you oh. so. <laughs> It really touched me. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
Thanks, Bob. I don't really know what I'm going to say, but it's very appreciative and grateful. Um, I just like sitting here, like as the silence and as the stillness, and for me, that's just like everything. It just feels like everything's energy, um, and it's like an it's a, like a, a refuge from what's going on on the surface. Not that there's a a split. Um, and I like what you said oh, just about life just unfolding on its own and it's all just happening spontaneously on its own and um, the mind like everything's everything's happening on its own everything's just flowing how, it, how it's going to flow and then the mind wants to get on top of it and grapple with it and sort of fight with it and um, you know there's no one there but that still appears at times and it's always like wrong as to what the outcome is like it's always different to what the mind think thinks is going to happen like what i'm noticing so i think for me it's just like there's a deep trust now that everything's un happening that it should be happening and it's happening as it's supposed to um and it's like a deep it's like just jumping in the river and let flow on with the river but at times you know it wants to change the direction of the river but it, it can't actually influence what's going on and it's an appearance anyway that doesn't has no power so it's really a big magic trick um and uh, yeah that's a lot of, well people are getting fooled by <laughs> but um yeah i just sometimes i think i've got to have the right words for this but i just like the like i say just the, the space and the stillness and that just feels where that like everything all the resources are and yet the appearances come out of it and give the impression that there's someone there and yeah anyway that's all i got mm. yeah it is amazing how everything's included even that behavior patterns you know sometimes you get up and you didn't sleep well at night and this the, the, the narrative may be negative or it may be picky or maybe a little irritable uh, and it may be just cursing under the nose but really that's that's all included that's kind of funny as well you know for a moment it may just go on and we sometimes uh, catch ourselves in that sort of a predicament you know Bob's having different pains at different times and it can be a little tiring but it never lasts the moment the complaint arises and it is noticed it becomes laughable it's the best joke in the world to listen to the mind complaining because just like Adrian was saying is uh, the mind is only narrating what is inevitably already happening by itself of its own mm -hmm. and that narrative doesn't change anything apart from the fact that if it is believed it causes psychological suffering but that's only if it is believed but if it isn't believed and it, it may still go on and it is and it is kind of hilarious it's kind of funny <laughs> it's like there was a, mm, that metaphor i think jamie brought it once it's a it's an old uh, zen metaphor about <coughs> about the mouse on the head of the elephant uh, the mouse sitting on the head on the head of the elephant an elephant runs through the forest and a mouse uh, representing the mind says okay run ahead and the elephant runs ahead and then mouse says okay turn to the left now and the elephant turns to the to the left and the mouse pop up oh I have a power over the elephant and over the forest I uh, he will tell whatever I he will do whatever I say <coughs> and then the mouse says elephant stop now but he keeps running turn to the right but he keeps running shit and that's actually the human condition the mind having that persistent illusion that it is in charge and it controls the events and if I will get offended I will just swear under the nose and some god of a mercy will actually do things as I dictate that's that's just laughable isn't it that's the mouse on the head of the elephant elephant is doing as it does it doesn't even know the mouse is there and realizing that that this is the function of the of the narrative to narrate not to control not to dictate but just to translate the urges 
if the urge is to go forward, the body will go forward, whether the mind will narrate what is happening or whether it will try to somehow alter, modify and change it or correct it. Realizing that everything has a function to assist life, that loving to be, meaning provide the safety and the pleasure for the body, whatever, in, in a means available. But it can't really, it doesn't have any power of its own. The idea that there is a self that is in charge, that should take responsibility and control myself and everyone else. That's just laughable. <coughs> it's, it's, it's funny when you see it. It's just the narrative, it's the pattern, the same way as you have the automatic subtitles. We had a couple of times people emailing us, why don't you put subtitles straight after Sunday meeting? Why do I have to wait three days? <laughs> well, we never put them, ever. I did spend a few days putting it like five years ago in Polish language for my <coughs> nation. But this is automatic captions. The program reads or listens to what people say and put automatic captions. They're not great. But for someone who doesn't speak English, they're better than nothing. That same way the narrative works. It takes apparently Libet experiment proved it takes about half a second when the urge arises or decision arises or choice arises before it gets translated into the narrative. And sometimes it gets mistranslated. And sometimes the belief seeps in and says, oh, this is me, this is I, I can do better than that. But it really is much, much, much simpler. It re everything works on autopilot. And the consciousness is that field of knowing of that autopilot functioning. Autopilot heartbeat, autopilot breathing, autopilot narr narrating. Noise is happening outside the house, noise is happening, seemingly happening inside, even though outside, inside is only, again, separation by image, by thought. If I don't have mental image that this is my body and I'm inside and now that is outside, well, everything happens here and here is limitless. It's only the thought and mental image that creates any illusion of separation. And it's a beautiful illusion because the world full of objects like, you know, full of plants and flowers and birds and people is gorgeous. It's just like in the dream. There are also flowers and mountains and people and animals and birds and music and, and conversations and food. And they appear real for appreciation. That capacity for loving to be is the capacity of appreciation. Um, just something that came to mind um, when the river of life turns against you and over turns your boat, don't swim against the undertow, turn on your back and float. That's Paul Hogan. It just occurred to me. <laughs> Good old Paul. And Catherine says uh, as an aside, Bob, did you think that Nisargadatta was a piece of shit? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Thank you, James. Yeah. He was the same as that bloke who just asked the question. <laughs> yes. But you can't help but have love and gratitude whenever the thought of him arises, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Even though he was just a mouthpiece. <laughs> well, that's how we feel. Yeah. It's only the one, one essence of patterns, shapes, forms, experiences, expresses everything. Are you aware of that? That's, that's right. <coughs> I've got a fellow. This rich man, rich, this is a tale from the Arabian Nights. You've probably heard it a million times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this fellow. Uh, sends his servant down to the marketplace to get some supplies and he's down there and he gets the supplies and he comes racing back. The home says, quick, quick master, he says, quick, quick, lend me your fastest horse so I can flee 
tonight to Baghdad to so escape no, they're in Baghdad. These are Somalia, so escaping. <laughs> and the master says, Okay, you know, so he lends him his horse and he hops on it and jumps out of the stable and flogs it down the road heading for Baghdad. And the master's taking a stroll later on in the day and he comes face to face with Viv. He says, Hey Viv. He says, What's the idea of scaring my friend away? He says, You're telling me. You frightened the hell out of him if he's going to die. He says, Well, I didn't mean to frighten him. He said, I didn't mean to scare him. He says, I got such a surprise to see him here in Baghdad that I was with him. No, tonight I've got a point with him in Samaria. He said, They gave him a nasty look. <laughs> So it happens as it happens. Inevitably. Even though it isn't really exactly predetermined <coughs> the way people usually ask. It's spontaneous. Yeah. But it's a good illustration. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Thanks, Bob. Great. Thanks, 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.